In this course, I'll be talking about the disadvantages of using standard hashing functions to encode passwords and present an alternative solution using what is called a password-based key derivation function. Traditionally, passwords would be hashed using an algorithm like MD5, SHA1 or SHA256 and then stored in a database. These stored and hashed passwords would then be used as part of a password-based authentication system. These hashed passwords could also be used as a key to encrypt data using cryptography algorithms like Triple DES, AES and TwoFish. For years, hashing has been the accepted standard when it comes to using and storing passwords. The rest of this module will not discuss encryption using hashed password keys, but focus on encoding passwords for authentication. Using hashing functions for storing passwords does have its problems though. Hash functions like MD5, SHA1 and SHA256 are all general purpose hash functions designed to calculate a message digest of large amounts of data in the shortest time possible. This means that they are excellent for ensuring the integrity of data, but they are not very good for storing passwords. As CPU and GPUs are getting faster, you can write code to make recovering a hash password easier and quicker. With these faster CPUs, you can do two types of attack against a hash password, brute force and rainbow tables. A brute force attack is an attack in which a computer tries every possible combination of characters for a password until it succeeds. Another type of attack is with rainbow tables. A rainbow table is a pre-computed table for reversing cryptographic hash functions. Rainbow tables are huge dictionaries and as computers get faster you can search for a password a lot quicker. One way to make a password hash harder to break is by salting the password. This is where you add a large sequence of randomly generated characters to the password. Once you have done this, you then hash the password as before. This does give extra protection, but you shouldn't really rely on it. A salted and hashed password is still recoverable by a rainbow table attack. The size of the rainbow tables will increase to contain many more permutations of passwords, and with computers getting faster, the time it takes to go through the table will get quicker. A salted password may be secure today, but in five years time, it could be quite easy to recover. What you need is a solution that helps guard against Moore's law and is future-proof. To get around this problem, we use what is called a password-based key derivation function, or as it is known, a PBKDF2. PBKDF2 is also known as a key stretching algorithm. This is a more general term used for password-based key derivation functions that secures against a brute force attack by increasing the time it takes to test each possible key. This is part of the RSA Public Key Cryptographic Standards, or PKCS for short. The part of the standards that are relevant to password-based encryption is PKCS number five, in version two of the standard. This standard is also published by the Internet Engineering Task Force as RFC 2898, which refers back to the PKCS number five standard. The reason this key derivation function works as a solution is because it is designed to be algorithmically slow, so the effectiveness of a rainbow table attack is greatly reduced. A password-based key derivation function is similar to a hash function to use. You have to provide it with an initial password to hash as well as a salt, except you do not pre-combine the password and the salt as before. You also have to provide a number of iterations parameter. This parameter tells the algorithm how many times to execute before returning the hash password. It is this number of iterations parameter that allows you to algorithmically slow down the key generation and help guard against a rainbow table attack. In a moment, we'll look at some demo code where we store some usernames and passwords using the password-based key derivation function, and then test authenticating the user using those passwords. Before we go into the demo, let's visualize the code. The sample project contains a class called Password Store. Password Store has two public methods, store password and authenticate user. Store password takes a username and a password and stores that combination into a dictionary. Normally, you'd store this in a database, but for the benefits of this demo, a dictionary is fine. The password will be encoded using the password-based key derivation function RFC 2898 derived bytes. Authenticate user also takes a username and password. Again, the password is encoded using the password-based key derivation function, and the username and password combination is compared to what is in the dictionary. If there is a match, then true is returned. The encoded password that is stored in the dictionary is first put into an object that contains the encoded password and the salt. The salt doesn't have to be kept secret. The salt is appended to the password internally in the RFC 2898 derived by its class before hashing to give more entropy to the password. Entropy is a measure of password strength. Password strength is a measure of the effectiveness of a password in resisting guessing and brute force attacks. In its usual form, it estimates how many trials an attacker who does not have direct access to the password would need on average to guess it correctly. The strength of a password is a function of the length, complexity and unpredictability. The salt is generated using a private method called generate salt. 
This method uses the RNG crypto service provider type in .NET to generate a 32 byte random byte array. RNG crypto service provider is a much better choice than using system.random. A system.random produces predictable random numbers, whereas RNG crypto service provider is considered a secure default for cryptographically secure random numbers in .NET. Before we look at the actual code sample, let's just summarize the two main .NET types that we'll be using for this demo. RFC 2898 derived bytes is our password based key derivation function used to perform the password stretching algorithm. The constructor for this type takes the password we want to stretch, a salt and a number of iterations parameter which determines how slow the stretching algorithm is. The slower the operation, the more security is against an attack. Once you have created the object, you then call get bytes by passing in the number of random key bytes to generate. In this demo, we will use a 32 byte array which is 256 bits in length. The second cryptographic type we will use is the RNG crypto service provider class. We will use this to generate our 32 byte salt value to store alongside the password. To generate the password number, we again call get bytes but this time we pass in an already initialized array that we want to fill with random numbers. First of all, let's look at our password store class. In this class, we have a read-only private property, which is a number of iterations. Then we have a dictionary where we store a string, which is the username, and a class called a password package, which is where we store our salt and encoded password. In the constructor, we pass in a number of iterations parameter, and this is stored internally in the class. Next, we have the store password method. This method takes a username and a password. First, we generate a salt. Then, we construct the RFC 2898 derived bytes class. In this class, we pass in a password, a salt, and a number of iterations. Then, we construct our password package, where we store the salt and the encoded password. To get the encoded password out of the password-based key derivation function, we call getBytes, and we pass in 32. And what this does is it tells the RSC2898 derived bytes objects that we want a 32-byte encoded password. Then, we store the password in our dictionary, using the username as a key, and the password package as the value. Then we have the authenticate user public method, which takes a username and a password. First of all, we extract the password package from the dictionary using the username as the key. Then we construct the RFC 2898 derived by its object, and we again pass in the password, the salt from our package, and the number of iterations. Then we get the password from the RFC 2898 derived bytes class by again calling get bytes and passing in 32. We then convert this into a string and store it in our method. Then we also do a get string conversion on the password in our password package and we check the two passwords to make sure they match. If they do, we return true. If they don't, we return false. Finally, we have our private method generate salt, and this is where we use the RNG crypto service provider class to generate our salted value. Once we've constructed the class, we then call get bytes and we pass in the pre-initialized array, which is 32 bytes in length, and then return the salt back to the calling method. Now, let's try calling this code from a test. In the following unit test, we construct our password store object and we pass in 1000 iterations. Then, we add three users into our dictionary. Once those users have been added, we then try and authenticate our user John with the following password. To demonstrate that the RFC 2898 derived by its object is supposed to be algorithmically slow, I set up a stopwatch around adding the user John, so we can see how long it takes. So, if we now go and run the test, I construct the password store object, initialize the stopwatch, and then add John into the dictionary. And as we can see, this takes nearly a second. Then we add George and Ringo. Next, we want to authenticate our user. So we call the authenticate user method and we pass in John and the password to check. We then extract our user from the dictionary, construct the RFC 2898 derived by its object and pass in the password, the extracted salt and a number of iterations. Then we get back our encoded password by calling get bytes and convert it into a string. We then convert the password from our password package into a string and we check that they match. So if we now go and look at our test explorer, you can see that this test has passed. So now let's demonstrate how the number of iterations makes a difference to RFC 2898. If I now go and change this to 50,000 iterations and then rerun the test. As we start the stopwatch and then add John into the dictionary, you saw that there was a noticeable pause as we did that, and the operation now took one and a half seconds. In this course, we have talked about how traditionally passwords were hashed with algorithms like MD5, SHA-1 and SHA-256, and then stored in a database. 
Hashed passwords can also be used as keys for encrypting data. These hashed passwords are susceptible to brute force dictionary attacks and also attacks using rainbow tables. To help guard against this, you can add a salt to the password before hashing. This makes the password much harder to recover using a brute force approach. But with CPUs and GPUs getting so fast, they can run billions of calculations per second, making password recovery more likely. To mitigate against this further, we can use what is called a key stretching algorithm or a password based key derivation function. This is also known as RFC 2898. This algorithm is designed to be slow to guard against computers trying to brute force attack a password with a dictionary or a rainbow table. You pass a number of iterations parameter into the key stretching algorithm to determine how slow the algorithm will be. This means that your key derivation function will scale with Moore's law as processors get much faster.